And we come today to our 15th study in the book of Jeremiah. And we are in Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 1. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, At that time, or at the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. And so once God's people have learned their lesson, they will know that the smartest way to go is obedience. And God, once again, will be their God in the sense of blessing. Two, thus saith the Lord, the people who were left of the sword found, found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. God says that he cares for his repenting people just as he cared for the Israelites who came out of Egypt. That's what he's talking about here. Both sought rest, both found it in God through the Savior, Jesus Christ, through faith. Verse 3, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. God's love for people is an everlasting love. You can't make God stop loving you. You just can't. He will let you reject him if you would rather burn in hell forever because he will honor your free will. But even in hell, he will still love you because it's his nature to love. Verse 4, again, I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be dorn with thy timbrels, and shalt go forth in the dances of those who make merry. Good times are coming for those who repent is the lesson of verse 4. Verse 5, Thou shalt yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall eat them as common things. In other words, God's people will always have, they will always have work. The difference is that in the new earth, we will enjoy it and it's going to pay very well. And that's what God is saying. You'll be able to work, but you'll be able to enjoy the fruits of your work. It will be productive. It will be enjoyable. As was Adam's work before he fell in the Garden of Eden. Verse 6. It says, Ask now. Oops, wrong chapter, sorry. I was reading in verse or in chapter 30. Chapter 31, verse 6, For there shall be a day that the watchmen upon Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise, and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. Fellowshipping with Jesus is cause for celebration. And that's what this is talking about. Sin is a terrible thing because it cuts that fellowship off. But when you can fellowship with God through Jesus Christ, it's celebration time. And this looks forward to to the day when God's people will have that unbroken fellowship with the Lord. 7. For thus says the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. God says, it's a good idea, good idea to sing about all the good that he does for his people. It's a good idea. Songs which are biblically accurate are a great way to learn about God and also a great way to remember God. Verse 8, Behold, I will bring them from the, from the north country and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her who travaileth with child together. A great company shall return here, the hurting, the needy, those who have special needs are all welcome in the kingdom of God. 
The Bible says, whosoever will may come. Verse 9. They shall come with weeping, and with supplication will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Tears of joy often accompany the sinner who turns to Christ and knows they are forgiven and heaven bound. Verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the coast afar off, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. You know, uh, the whole world needs to hear the, the word of God. And so he says here in verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye nations, and declare it in the coast afar off. The whole world needs to hear God's word. God punishes rebels who refuse to change, but he welcomes all repenting sinners. That's a message that the entire world needs to hear today. 11. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him who was stronger than he. Sinners cannot defeat sin or sin's penalty by their own strength. But any sinner who receives Christ will find that Jesus will defeat sin and its penalty for them. 12. Therefore, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for grain and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and, for, and of the herd. And their soul shall be like a watered garden and they shall not sorrow any more at all. And so there's going to be a lot of happy faces for God's people on the new earth. In fact, that's all we're going to see. And we're going to be happy, and we're going to see joy and happiness in the faces of everybody that we see, especially when we see the goodness of God and all that we will have to look forward to forever. There were happy faces when God brought his people back from captivity in the Old Testament, there will be happy people and happy faces when we get to live on the new earth as well. Free from corruption, death, sickness, pressures of life. 13. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. For I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. Everyone will have many good reasons to be happy on the day that Jesus makes the new heavens and the new earth. Verse 14. And I will fill to the full the soul of the priest with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. A feast for the soul refers to holy wisdom and knowledge and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, meekness, and self-control. Those things are a spiritual feast for the soul. Verse 15. Thus saith the Lord, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. And so we see from this that the punishment of God was very severe. And it was severe because the sin that they committed was willful and serious and ongoing. 16. Thus saith the Lord, Restrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there, and there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning, bemoaning himself. Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised. Like a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke, turn me back, and I shall be restored. For thou art the Lord my God. 
You know, God has to tame his people in order to get them used to doing things his ways instead of their own way. And it can be a painful process. But it will come to pass if a person has a willing heart, which causes them to hang in there. It's sort of like getting a bull used to wearing an oak, a yoke. It's, it's a painful process for that bull, but you know, the, the quicker he submits to the master, the happier he's going to be. He needs to fall in line. And so do God's people. Verse 19. Surely, after I was turned away, I repented. And after I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did not bear the reproach of my youth. Or I did bear the reproach of my youth. And so he slapped his thigh, the Bible says, which was a sign that he hated how he had sinned and that he had repented. Verse 20. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spoke against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my heart is troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. Ephraim refers to God's people here, as it does throughout this, this book of Jeremiah. Ephraim refers to God's people, and they were hardly a dear son in light of their constant rebellion. And yet, despite that, God's love for his people did not skip a beat. We cannot earn God's love. And like I said earlier, we cannot stop him from loving us either. God still considers us his dear children, even when we certainly do not deserve that title. Verse 21. Set thee up way marks. Make thee high heaps. Set thine heart toward the highway, even the way which thou wentest. Turn again, O virgin of Israel, turn again to these thy cities. In other words, remember the road you traveled when you went into exile because you're coming back home, says God. You're coming back home the same way, the same way that you left. That's how you're going to return. So remember. Verse 22. And of course, God is, just, God is just offering hope to his people. That's what these verses are all about. And, and the message was given originally to Israel, but the message is timeless for God's people. 22. How long wilt thou go about O thou backsliding daughter. For the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. Now, the woman here in verse 22 is a reference to Mary. And the man is Jesus. And the new thing is that the God-man Jesus was actually conceived by the Virgin Mary without the help of a human man. God did it all. And it was a new thing. It was a unique thing, a once, a once in, the, in a lifetime, once in a world time thing. Verse 23, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, As yet they shall use this speech in the land of Judah and in its cities, when I shall bring again their captivity. The Lord bless thee, O habitation of justice and mountain of holiness. Jerusalem will be the place of justice and worship just like in the old days. 24. And there shall dwell in Judah itself and in all its cities together, farmers and they who go forth with flocks. And so people in the cities and even people who live outside the city walls in the country will feel safe. Verse 25. For I have fulfilled, or I have filled full the weary soul. And I have replenished every sorrowful soul. See, there's nothing that God cannot fix. That's the message of verse 25. There's nothing which God cannot fix. No soul is too, too down and too depressed for God to refresh. 26. Upon this I awaked and beheld, and my sleep was sweet unto me. And so after getting these comforting words of good news from God, Jeremiah felt better. The word of God plays a huge part in God refreshing his people. 
See, if God's people would just take the time to read the Word when, when they don't feel like reading the Word. Because when you don't feel like reading the Word, that's when you really need to, to read the Word. God would bless and he would refresh. 26. Upon this I awaked and beheld, and my sleep was sweet unto me. And so, again, after getting these comforting words, Jeremiah felt better. 27. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. See, the land had been depopulated by God's judgment. Many were killed. The remnant were taken away into captivity. But God says when punishment has run its course, all that will be reversed. God will fill the land with blessing. Fill the land with blessings, just as before. He had to fill the land, refill the land with blessings that he had to remove in order to get them to wake up and repent. And it's unfortunate, you know, that that's the way it has to go sometimes, but sometimes that's the only thing that works, is to drag us through hard times so that we wake up and draw close to God once again. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. Well, God supervises over our punishment, and he supervises over our blessing as well. He gives us what we need when we need it. Sometimes we need chastisement. Sometimes we need comfort. Sometimes we need blessing. He knows best. 29. In those days they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. You know, the judgment was so severe back in the days when Babylon came in and conquered Israel. The judgment was so severe that its effects spilled over on those who had not even sinned, on the innocent. You know, their problem was they were living close to the ones who had sinned, which was most of the country. But still... God says, you know, it's not going to be that way, especially on Judgment Day, in the future. God's judgment will be, will be, ba will be, uh, will be on an individual level. Verse 30, actually verse 31. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the, east, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Thus saith the Lord, who giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, who divideth the sea when its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Behold, well, let's stop right there for a second. That's an awful lot of verses to cover, but let me summarize them by saying this new covenant spoken of first in verse 31. This new covenant that God promises is clearly different from the one that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. The laws of that first covenant were written on tablets of stone. 
and forgiveness in that covenant involved bringing the right sacrifices to the tabernacle and it involved uh, adhering to the rules of the Levitical priesthood and it was very complicated and very burdensome. The new covenant is different totally. The new covenant and the sacrifice for sin in that new covenant was Jesus Christ on the cross and those who receive Christ as Lord and Savior do not get a copy of the Ten Commandments written on a stone tablet. God the Holy Spirit puts the law of God in their soul. In other words, they know what is right and they know what is wrong. And there's also a desire to do what is right because that covenant is written in their heart. God gives us a new heart through Jesus Christ. Verse 38, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananel unto the gate of the corner and the measuring line shall yet go forth over against it upon the hill Gareb and, and shall compass about to Goa and the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields unto the brook of Kidron unto the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be holy unto the Lord it shall not be plucked up, nor thrown down any more forever. And so uh, things will be right, basically, is what he is saying. Things will be right for God's people because Jesus will pay for our sins in that new covenant, which, thank God, we are in today. And God's people will be forgiven. And God's people are restored to God. And so the fellowship is unbroken unless we commit sin. And then it's just a matter of confessing. You know, we don't have to bring an animal sacrifice. And how blessed we are. The offering of Jesus Christ took care of our sins and reconciled us to God. And we'll pick it up in chapter 32 next time. Until then, so long, everyone.